this is ET, many factors accelerate the excitement for boxing fans. Among them, what? Religion, country, city, neighborhood. But nothing seems to roil the blood more than race and ethnicity. But what more than anything actually draws fans to pay money to see about? Well, it's a good matchup. And many of those matchups are intra religion, intra race. Well, think of Foreman versus Lyle, Hagler versus Hearns. This is Benny Leonard from New York. He's Jewish, a Hall of Fame ranked by boxing historians near or at the top of best pound for pound boxers ever. But Benny Leonard was almost beaten by another Jewish fighter, Lou Tendler of Philadelphia, one of the greatest Southpaws ever. And like the great Sam Langford, one of the best to never win a world title. He learned to fight as a newspaper boy in Philadelphia. That's the way he preserved his territory. At age 15, Tendler began boxing professionally. That was, I think, 1913. As a young professional, he started out as a bantamweight, and he later developed into one of the hardest punchers in the lightweight division. In 1922, the year of the first Leonard Tendler fight, that was maybe the strongest lightweight division in boxing history. We had fighters like oh, Rocky Kansas, uh, Freddie Welch, I'm trying to think, uh, Kilbrain, uh, Johnny Kilbrain, Johnny Dundee. And Leonard, during this period, showed himself to be the greatest lightweight of all of them. But Tendler, in their first meeting in front of 60,000 screaming fans, came very close to dethroning Leonard. In fact, some say he did. Leonard was known as the Ghetto Wizard. In 1917, he took the lightweight crown from Freddie Welch. Tex Record, one of the greatest promoters ever, he promoted the dempsey Carpentier fight, the Battle of the Century. Well, he promoted this one, another big outdoor bout, and this time the lightweights. Leonard, classic stylist, a very quick right hand. Lou Tendler, also Jewish, rugged southpaw brawler. He had a very powerful left. The pre-fight publicity hyped the rivalry between Benny and Lou, and part of it was New York versus uh, Philadelphia. But in this case, it appeared genuine. The two did not like each other. And it worsened after Leonard postponed and later canceled an earlier scheduled fight with Tendler. And Tendler thought it was because Leonard could not make the 135-pound limit. The fight took place on a very warm night, July 27, 1922. In round one, Tendler was on the offensive. He was the one who landed the hard right hands. He also opened up a cut over Leonard's left eye. And Tendler was working the midsection, too, and it was working. Leonard was slowing down. In the second round, both are grappling and holding. Tendler was accused of throwing low blows. In round three, the low blows continue, and the referee gave him a warning. Nonetheless, Tendler is still winning these rounds. Round four, the action increased. Both men landing hard punches. Leonard threw a right that staggered Tendler, who then buckled Leonard with a left. At the bell, he landed a right. So now four rounds have gone to the challenger. Round five is Leonard's. Round six, Leonard has Tendler bleeding and in trouble. That was after a series of right hands and then an uppercut. You can tell reading the accounts that Lou Tendler is tiring out. In round seven, the champion is easily outboxing the challenger. But in round eight, Tendler almost became a lightweight champion of the world. This southpaw fighter 
used a right lead, not simply to jab, but also set up his own powerful left. After about a minute of stalking Leonard, Tendler threw a quick right. As he pushes forward, then landed a left cross. Leonard's legs buckled. He's sagging. Then he clutches and pushes Tendler backwards. Lou tries to break loose, but he can't. Then, this is one of the strangest things in boxing history, the champion began to talk. Now, some newspaper accounts say he's complaining to Tendler about the low blows. Others say we don't know what he was saying. He was talking Yiddish. Many years later, Leonard said he talked in a calm way to buy time. He said things like, oh, that was a good punch, Lou. Now, I said, I'm quoting uh, Leonard here. I said it to him in a friendly, matter-of-fact tone of voice, and it put the fight on a different plane. Lou snarled, never mind that, come on and fight. But I stuck out a restraining hand, and I said, no, Lou, that really was a good punch. It was all right. Lou then paused. And by that time, I had recovered my senses. By the end of that round, which was won by the champion, a new cut appeared in Tendler's mouth. The last three rounds, well, they all went to Leonard. He had taken total control. He used his heavy right hand. He would stun Tendler several times during the 10th round. And in the final two rounds, uh, you can read he easily outboxes Lou Tendler. Almost all the newspapers gave it to Leonard, but by a pretty close margin. One or two papers did award it to Tendler. Some observers said, well, let's call it a draw. Ring Magazine, probably the more objective publication at the time, called it for Leonard by a shade. The referee said, and I'm quoting, it was Leonard all the way. Because of the no decision rule at this time, in other words, newspapers would rule on who wins or loses, uh, Leonard kept the title. Next year, he and Tendler met again. This time at Yankee Stadium, there was no newspaper decision. And as a result, the great Benna Leonard won the undisputed points in 15 rounds. This is AT. Did you enjoy the video? If so, tap the like icon. Subscribe to this channel. Tap the bell icon. You'll be notified of new uploads. Type in your comments below. Thank you.